I think I think we're re ready to go, right? Someone, someone with authority, can someone tell me? Where's Brian? Let's do it. Okay, group decision. Cool. So thanks everyone coming for the panel. I think this is like the third PAX Prime uh, that we've done a Daisy panel at. Uh, Going to provide a little bit of information to kind of kick things off, but hopefully it's more Q and A oriented. So once I get about two slides in, if someone again, if an adult could. Uh, start getting people to come up if they've got questions. So start thinking about your questions. You can ask pretty much anything and uh, I'll try and answer it even if I don't like the question. Actually the, the bad, the nasty questions are kind of the best because you get asked the same thing again and again so it's, it's kind of fun to have something challenging. Uh, cool, so uh, without further ado let's start. So just a quick recap, we released the standalone finally in December last year. We just hit 2.5 million players. We uh, dramatically expanded the scope of Daisy quite a lot in, um, in May. And, uh, um, and that, that included going cross-platform quite a lot. So I guess that was quite a big change for us. Obviously, there was some legitimate concern from the PC users when we announced the PS4 recently. But I, from my perspective, the advantage it br it's really brought to us is the ability to add in a new renderer, which I'll cover off on later. The team has actually grown from 40, uh, sorry, from four to over 40 within one year, which is really huge growth. And I'm sure all the people who've worked on teams before know all the fun and exciting things that come from <laughs> dramatically expanding your team. We're also spread uh, across at least two sites. So the, uh, our teams kind of split almost evenly between Bratislava in Slovakia and uh, Prague in the Czech Republic. So it's, uh, and it's a quite an international team. We have like Russians, we have, uh, well, Russian, Senshi, our resident Russian. Uh, Americans and you know British and New Zealand and, and everything else so it's a real kind of interesting little team. Uh, this is really hard to see but we'll post it on um, like uh, Reddit or Twitter or stuff later on. Basically uh, one of our programmers um, who's been handling all the server mechanics he's done a massive loot analysis and uh, just gone totally crazy. So raised our programmer uh, basically here in the top 10, uh, the top item, and man I can't even read it on my laptop, uh, it's like canned beans and canned sardines, which kind of makes sense. So uh, on the left there is the top 10 and on the right is the top 100. So we'll post that on Reddit later on. But basically this is kind of a symbol of, of the phase that we're heading into now. When we're really looking at what is the me what, what, it, what can we do with the mechanics that we've actually made. because can I hands up all those people who think that the loot mechanics are kind of completely broken? That guy was pretty quick over there. <laughs> um, loot mechanics are kind of broken. So, yeah, I, here, me. So, so um, what was that? Not enough Pepsi. Not enough Pepsi, that's right. Actually, I, 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 can't, I wish I could read this a bit better and see where can drink. Uh, is can drink in the top 10, Brian? Yes. Yes. Awesome. So, there we go. Um, so I, I think I've probably had too much Pepsi while I've been in Seattle, but I always do that. So yeah, this, this is kind of, for me personally, I actually found that between say January until the point we had loot respawning, I, I was actually finding Daisy quite boring because if we, when we didn't have the loot respawning in, it meant that it was so hit or miss whether you actually got a decent server. And at least now with the loot respawn in, even though there are some really hilarious buggy moments, uh, at least now it means that it's not so hit or miss whether you actually get on a decent server. So the new renderer. Can I just have a quick show of hands? Or who are, how many of those people actually kind of understand what we mean uh, in terms of the new renderer? If you're like confident in what that means. Okay, so I think, I think quite a few people do. That's good. So basically, because I don't think we've explained this super well, so I'm going to try and do that now. What it means is we can, what we're doing is we're changing DayZ so that you can actually put in new graphics APIs really easily. So at the moment, the way we render the game is really tightly bound to the simulation. 
That means if we wanted to upgrade to DirectX 10 or DirectX 11, it's a huge amount of work. Like, think of all the parts of the game that have visual output, and then imagine that you have to go through and rewrite all those parts. We have over 1.2 million lines of code, so that's a lot of places that you have to touch. So we have a team right now, they're going through it, they've been going through it since early in the year, and they're entirely replacing the way the game is rendered. Uh, what, it, what it will do is it'll allow us to do things like dynamic lighting and dynamic shadows, which earlier in this year I spent quite a long time convincing people we would never do. So if you've learned anything from what I say, uh, it's probably wrong. So, um, but that's a, that's a good result, and that opportunity is huge, and that's why I've kind of embraced the console development, because it spreads the risk and it means we can do stuff like this. It's going to vastly improve the client frame rate. We haven't been able to do much with the client frame rate because a lot of the improvements we've already got are because the client exists in this little bubble and they only get information inside that bubble. Anyone who knows anything about, I guess, DirectX 11 knows that there are a lot of really good optimizations in terms of how your polygons are rendered and all that kind of stuff. So we're pretty excited about that. And I guess it brings it in line with modern games. If you've been down to the Astro booth and compared DayZ, while I think DayZ looks really beautiful, it does look dated. And so that's what we're going to be able to achieve with this. And also OpenGL, you know, let's, let's get a Linux port going. That'd be, that'd be awesome. It does require our artists to go through and basically retouch all models. It means that modders are going to have to build DayZ mods using FBX rather than P3D. But I think a lot of modders are going to be sitting there going, yay, we can use FBX. The cool thing is, that's actually in the engine now. I just checked the check-ins the other day. Brian's kind of, he's, is he, is he face-palming yet? Oh no, he's, he's happy for me to tell us. That's good. <laughs> so, so we've already got uh, FBX models uh, loading in and stuff like that. So we were planning on releasing modding about this time this year, but we're going to wait until a new render is in because basically the modders would have to make all their models again. Uh, and I think, I think modding's actually going to really revolutionize DayZ when it comes out. I've been playing a heap of space engineers. Anyone else playing space engineers? It's good, right? That new modding system, that's really good. Like, it's so seamless. You just join the server and it, it downloads the mods. So we're really excited about how modding can come in for DayZ. Vehicles. So they're in active development. Um, they're being com they've been completely redone from scratch. Uh, our like lead, our like tech lead, uh, Fido, he's been. This has kind of been a labor of love for him. We implemented a SDK called Bullet Physics, and it's a really cool little SDK that has allowed us to do ragdoll. We've got um, Jan has been working on things like dragging and falling ragdoll and stuff like that beyond what we've already got. But what it's really going to give us is full physics for vehicles. And already, and the stuff that he's been doing, I was really hoping we could show some video here, but it just wasn't at the point we could. But you can just really feel, it's like the vehicles really feel good. Uh, so it's gonna, I think it's gonna feel real satisfying to plow a helicopter into the side of the hospital in Cherno, so that's what I'm waiting for. Uh, it's component-based. We're still, we're still exploring what exactly that means, but at the minimum, it's going to function like your attachments, where you'll attach like a battery, a fuel tank, you can choose all that kind of stuff, and I think that's really going to help. But, but kind of on the basis of everything, I think, uh, I think really what is really going to benefit us is the modding when we open it up. Like, you know, we're going to get, hopefully, the teams like the Epoch teams and that will actually move to Daisy and and start doing some cool stuff. Zombie AI. Uh, this is uh, spread across two teams at the moment, uh, Prague and Br Br Bratislava. Uh, Bratislava were the team who worked on and successfully implemented um, our, our methods to solve the, the wall warping and running through the walls and stuff like that, which is the navigation mesh. So they've, they've achieved some fantastic results. They're also the team um, who were working on the console who actually got us 64-bit servers. So they've been doing some great work, and uh, I'm pretty excited about where they're heading in terms of the AI. Our aim is to return to the mod. So if, if you played the mod, you'll realize that stealth was really a big deal. Uh, we changed the whole way that 
Zombies AI was calculated with a standalone. And the mod, they were actually calculated on the client. That meant that we could have a heap of zombies without a big impact on the server. But to deal with hacking and stuff like that, we moved everything to the server. So it kind of reintroduced a performance problem, which we've been tackling for the last year. And I think that combined with multi-core support for servers, like true multi-core support, which will come in soon, we'll actually be able to deal with that. So we're pretty close to being able to show some of that implementation on Experimental. And I think it will dramatically change the way the gameplay, gameplay works. So let's, uh, let's rock into the Q&A. Uh, I don't know how we're doing this. Are we, just, are we just handing around a microphone or something? So hopefully you guys have got some really good questions. So I think uh, like uh, put your hand up or stand up or like blow a whistle. Yeah, could you guys queue up? So the hat, the hat guy, follow, follow the hat guy. How much time do we have as well before I get too carried away? Oh, sweet. OK, so let's see if we can get some good questions in. Yeah so, so, yeah, so we want to make the process a lot more seamless. We've been kind of learning what the Armour 3 team are doing with implementing the Steamworks. Because it's a bit complicated with Armour compared to something like Space Engineers. The mods can be quite extensive. So what we're looking at doing is kind of having it that basically you can use kind of one mod pack um, and actually download that in. So. Yeah, we're looking at doing it on a public scale. I'd really love it to function a lot like how Space Engineers does, so that when you, down, when you join the server, it actually downloads the mods. We're working quite closely with Valve to see how we can achieve that. Because Daisy's a little different. We actually provide two kinds of files with the modding. Sorry, two, two files for each kind of mod. One is the, obviously the data pack, but also the signature file, which is a very complicated, like, uh, special thing to make sure that someone's not um, changing the files so that they can't hack. So we've got to be real cautious about that, and that's kind of our stumbling block. So yeah, basically we want to see it that you'll see a bunch of like vanilla Daisy servers, but if you want to, you can join these mod servers, and you'll just be able to seamlessly be able to join them and and get the files. And let's use Steam CDN because it's free. <laughs> so. Thank you. Cool. I'm uh, glad to see that more love for the zombies and uh, understand all the technical problems with moving them all to the server and everything. But your vision for the end product, um, I remember hearing talk of like roaming towards the zombies and like uh, following your, your scent and that kind of thing. So if, um, if all the technical problems can be solved and the zombies can be huge volumes on the servers, are those still things that you would like to have in the end game and like, what other kind of things do you want to have for the zombies? Yeah, so the team that's actually working on animals is kind of exploring a lot of these concepts. Because basically the aim is that when uh, players aren't within reach of an animal, they kind of just exist as this virtual thing. Uh, the Bratislava team, their experience comes from, uh, they were originally members of a studio called Cauldron in Slovakia. And they worked on a hunting game. I can't actually remember the name of it, but it's really cool. And what they were looking at doing was, uh, and a lot of the work they did, was actually have the animals go through kind of a, a daily cycle, where they'll go to like water to get a drink and stuff like that. So if we're successful implementing that without overloading the server, then we can apply those mechanics to the zombies so that we can have them roam around. And when you're, they're not around a player, they won't have a big overhead on the server because they'll just be this virtual like mob. And then when a player gets nearby, the server will say, OK, I need to, you know, I need to actually create the entities for this mob. And that's what we're kind of hoping to do. There are some gameplay issues associated with that, because at the moment, we're kind of just magicking the zombies anywhere. But we've got a pretty solid team led by Peter, our designer. And I'm pretty confident that they're going to be able to deal with those issues. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Cool. Hey, uh, so you said, you mentioned like fourth quarter or something like that, you hope to distribute vehicles out and whatnot. And, oh, thank you so much. Uh, I was also Teamwork. wondering, uh, uh, what? Oh, anyways. Uh, I was also wondering when are like high schools, you 
said like little vehicles and APVs and whatnot are going to be coming out that third quarter or whatever. When can we expect to see those like baby specifically? Uh, Brian will kill me. He's like, is he face palmed? Well, just let him kill you. You'll have um, a respond. Uh, we're, we're actually. <laughs> We're, that's right. We're actually working on them now. Yeah. So I would say we're looking at um, basically when the initial implementation is ready, we'll be testing them on, on experimental. Sure. We, we'll be reluctant to post them to uh, stable too quickly because there'll be some problems with that. But basically, I, w I wouldn't be surprised if, if uh, yeah, well before the. Uh, no, I think actually, like, if you look at bicycles, bicycles actually present more problems than a standard four-wheeled vehicle, particularly as we're going for full physics. So I think our first vehicles are actually going to be small vehicles. We've been talking whether to do like a four-wheeler or we're probably going to stick with a small car or something like that because they kind of provide the broad range of, okay, they've got like a lot of attachments of the wheels. So you could put like, you know, four different kinds of wheels on your car and it's going to be this weird looking car and stuff like that. So. That's the first place we're going to start. But I, I wouldn't be surprised if in the next couple of months that we see that appear on experimental as an initial test. Sure. But also, I, last question, uh, beans or sardines? Which one do you prefer? Uh, what, what's in that? Is that sardines? Uh, yeah, totally. I'm not, I'm not a big fan of sardines, oh, I have to beans. say. Okay, Definitely beans. Here it comes. Thanks, man. Just Cheers. kidding. I'm a bandit. I'm sorry. I'm a bandit. Nice. Actually, I got really hungry after Gamescom, and I didn't have uh, I didn't have any food in my apartment, and I ended up eating one of the original Daisy cans of beans because I was really <laughs> sick. I had like bronchitis; someone infected me, and uh, and so yeah, I ended up sitting there just eating this rewarmed can of beans. It was amazing. Uh, hey. Hey. Uh, so, am I thinking that the current build, I guess, of the Hey, can I just stop you? Are you the guy on Reddit who did the X? Yep. Okay, just while you're talking, I'm going to get a little photo of you. <laughs> Carry on. I couldn't bring a motorcycle helmet. I didn't really took it to see What? He took your motorcycle helmet? It's not my ass. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. I stole my motorcycle helmet. Yeah, so uh, it might be the most... Uh, the one aspect of the game that I think has not been seen any love uh, or have heard anything about is the sound design. Um, it, can you go into some detail about like, are you going to be implementing like door sounds, more varied zombie sounds, um, new weapon sounds, stuff like that, um, and just kind of give us a little update. Yeah, so basically sound has kind of been the poor cousin in the, dis in the, in the development team. So uh, we've got our sound designer, uh, and he's, it's kind of hard for him because we haven't really teamed him up with a lot of people. It's a good example of one of the challenges we face with the development. Um, so normally in a game, you'll often focus on the long-term best way of doing things. But with Daisy development, we kind of have to focus on both the short-term and the long-term. And sometimes that means we need to develop two solutions. A good example is animals. We come up with a very simple, quick solution which was going to get completely replaced by our other solution. So we're actually working on a whole new element to the engine, like a complete redesign of the way sounds work. But that's going to take, that's not going to appear till next year. So the challenge has been to identify areas of sound that we can improve on. Uh, we haven't got anything 100% confirmed yet, except for frequency change of sounds based on distance, so we can apply filtering to them. What I really wanted to see happen, uh, and I put as a challenge to the team, was, if, have you played Camp Company of Heroes? So Company of Heroes is awesome, because as you move the mouse further away from like the artillery, it's like dampened, and there's a whole bunch of filtering applied. So that's something we have 100% confirmed. And I think, is it done yet, Brian? The low pass filter? Yeah. Yeah, 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 so that's, that's going to... So, so that's done, so that's coming in. So that's sort of an example of we're just now, we've got the flexibility to actually get in and do, that, do this. So it's basically a balance between what is the long-term awesome, we're going to replace everything, and what is the stuff we can do now. Uh, and, uh, and then I guess, because you know, it's not just good enough that we go through and we just tack on s sound effects, because the sound technology we're using is very old. So it's a matter of kind of redeveloping and going in and doing stuff. One thing I, I really want to see happen is reverb and side buildings. 
uh, which is something we've talked about, but I don't think we've actually, we've actually started yet, or, or someone might have looked at it, but we haven't finished it off. That's another good example of something simple we can do. One of the problems we have is that Armour calculates everything based on the event that happens. So if the event doesn't happen on your client, in some ways, you cannot end up getting the sound effect. And this is where a lot of people say, oh, I'm being, I've been hacked or whatever, I've been killed by a hacker. In actual fact, the, the client that killed you might not, have, uh, might not have spawned in on your client yet because of some latency on the server. So the server knows you were killed, the person who shot you knows that you were killed, but your client was told to create a sound effect for an entity that doesn't exist on it. So what we're trying to do is split that up and say the sound and this is how all proper MMOs do it, so the sound will actually occur as an independent thing. So even if you can't see the person who did it, you'll still hear the sound. And other people around them will hear a sound that's like a boom or whatever that's run through the low-pass filter. Does that help your question? Uh, yeah. Cool. Uh, as a space building, what are you going to do as like a space engineer's type? Transparent? Yeah, look, one of the things I'm super jealous of space engineers is because it's set in space, it's this kind of like blank tapestry. So they can do a lot of stuff um, without having to worry about performance. Like our scene's already crazy complex. Like, you know, you only need to run into the center of Electro or somewhere to just see what happens to your frame rate. And while the new render is going to help with that, ultimately we do need to deal with scene complexity. H have you played uh, The Dead Linger? The, the Dead Linger? It's an um, early access game that came through on Kickstarter. I think they got $150,000. So they have a really awesome barricading mechanism. Basically, you float the object in front of you and it can, and like, can hit stuff and things like that. So you move it around, you get it in the position you want, and then you just like, okay, attach it here. That's what we're looking at doing for the barricading initially. Once we've got that working and we're happy with the performance and the gameplay impact from it, then we'll look at full-on construction. Because the problem is, if you've barricaded a house and you're like, yay, we've protected it all, someone could join another server and then go into that place and then spawn back in. So we need to deal with those game design issues so it's not kind of a just about dealing with how the client places it. Yeah, did you have any specific questions about the base building or? Guys are like maybe third quarter or fourth. We haven't started on it yet. I think the natural person to start on that is Jana. She's our physics programmer. So at the moment, she's tidying up how Ragdoll works. And I think Ragdoll was a huge thing. I'm so glad we got that in. Took a, very, took a, took a lot of work to get that through, but it set a really good uh, platform. So she's also, she's, uh, she did the uh, development on throwing and stuff like that. What she's actually working on at the moment is replacing the player controller completely so that you don't feel like you're a person walking around with a washing machine strapped on your back. Um, and so she's having good work from that. We were actually hoping to show a video of it, but she's, there's still a bit of work to be done. So I think once she's finished that later on in the year, then she'll be able to decide. I think probably the next thing she'll work on will be um, dragging players, because that's cool. Uh, so I think uh, either, yeah, either uh, there's plenty of shenanigans that can come from that. And also I think it's, Imagine someone suiciding off a building and you see their body, like, at the moment it's just like they're like this as they fall down and it doesn't have the same impact as if they're going, oh my god, <laughs> flowers, there's so much to live for. Um, and uh, yeah, so once we've done that, then we'll look at base building. We've already got the designers looking at it, but we won't see on an experimental, I don't think, before the end of the year. Cool. Uh, I know that you love space engineers a lot. Um, I have two questions. When is your next stream with Pike Man? Because the last one was pretty epic. Um, and then also, after you're done at Bohemia, will there be a space engineer's Daisy? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, it's cool because the space engineers uh, teams in Prague as well. I haven't actually met up with them. A very cool game. I was actually playing it. The way I prepared for my flight here was I played space engineers till 4.40 in the morning so that I was tired and then just slept all the way on the plane. Um, and it got to 4.40 and I was like, wow, I should really pack because the taxi's coming at 5. Uh, but we built this big, like, um, how can I describe it? Like, s sort of corkscrew, large-scale, um, like, mining ship that could actually burrow through the asteroids. I haven't, I haven't checked on how the success of it is. 
I hope they haven't broken it while I've been away, my friends. Uh, it's, it's great. I really like it as a game, and I think there's a lot of inspiration that can come from, from Daisy with that. So who knows? Maybe someone will mod it and add in zombies. That would be pretty cool. I, there was a cool mod for Minecraft someone posted on Reddit just recently. I mean, I know there's been a few, but the trailer for that one looked pretty awesome. Mm. Say again, crafting? Right. Yeah, so we've had a real challenge with crafting. Uh, a lot of some of the like little, I, I've been playing around with modding Space Station 13 a lot, um, and that it's a real simple little game, and in some ways doing crafting in a simple game is so much easier. Like I really like how some of the crafting and the building works in the forest, and I kind of wish we could do that. But there's so many challenges you face with a multiplayer game in terms of dealing with a lot of these situations. Like if we did a lot of that on the client, then the opportunity for hacking is so great. We're not super happy with how the context menu system works at the moment because it can get really confusing. So I think we're gonna go through a massive reorganization of crafting after we've got the new UI that comes from the new renderer because there might be a lot more opportunity to change the whole way that works. Oh, did you have any specific questions about the crafting or just sort of in general? So there's not going to be any real big improvements in the short term until sort of completing the UI. Uh, well, I think we'll continue to see stuff expanded, but I, I just think there's a fundamental problem with the way our action system works. Like I think crafting in a game like DayZ works a lot better if it's um, if it's put more into f sort of first person. So when you place your fireplace down, you should actually be going in and like interacting with it more. Like it's cool to create stuff in your hands, and that's an awesome mechanic, and, and I think we can improve that in the short term pretty quickly. But as an example, have you played Frostfall mod for Skyrim? It's really awesome. So basically, when you want to light your fire, you put your torch in your hand, and your torch is like lit and burning, and you just smash your fireplace with it, and it just feels really visceral. And I, I think that like it just, it just feels really good. And I think that that's, and you know with Minecraft when you want to activate a button you like smash it. And so we want to try and do that with crafting as much as we can. So you get the rock in your hand and you put the rock in the fireplace and so that we can try and like put the player directly in it. So they get this real pop, this real visceral nature of the actual construction rather than it's sort of this contrived mechanic with a billion different, uh, you know, menus and drop downs and stuff like that. And yeah, I, I don't think it's something we can solve quickly in the short term. The short term fix is really just to put, well not fix, the short term approach is just to put as much crafting in as possible so we can see this is all the kind of stuff we want to do. Like with fishing and stuff like that. So fishing, fishing wasn't an idea we really had on the roadmap. Our um, designer, we call him Captain Questions because during his interview he asked like a million questions which is awesome. So he, he was like, I, I really want to do fishing. And he had, he'd kind of made this little prototype. And we were like, wow, that's really cool. So we, we, we just want to find all those different crafting options and start putting them in. Yeah. Well, was there any stuff you found that you didn't like about the existing crafting? Um, well, the, the menu system is kind of awkward. Um, it's kind of awkward? Yeah. Yeah, do you think it's the context menu that does that, or the drag and the drop, or? Well, it's a combination of like, when I see a word, I'm not really sure what it means necessarily. It took me a while to figure out that to put the ammo into the gun and mm -hmm. break it out. I thought it was going to drop on the ground. Yeah, this is one of those things where you feel like you're really clever as a designer, because you're like, let's make a game where people don't know what to do, and, and they explore and they find it out. But the, the legitimate question is, what happens if they can't figure it out? And, and there's, a point, <laughs> there's a point of frustration, right, at which you're just being a dick. You're not being a designer. And I think we've probably passed that point a few times. Um, so we need to be less dickish and more designish. I'm really lazy, so um, hopefully now that Peter's more in charge of the design, he'll be more like, uh, OK, no, we should not be so much of a dick. So. Um, yeah, it's, I, I like how we have some exploration elements, like you, you're the person who discovered you can do this or that, but I think if we can make the crafting more intuitive, that those options will come in. One of the things that really restricts us at the moment is our UI system. Uh, um, 
Joe, who, who did a lot of the UI work for, who does a lot of the UI work for the mod, he just posted on Reddit this really awesome concept for the main menu. Has, has anyone seen it? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's good, right? So, you know, it's like the main menu concept and stuff like that. The unfortunate thing is, the UI system at the moment for Armor, um, it dates back to like, like Operation Flashpoint. It's really old. We can't do additive effects and all that kind of stuff. So it's really hard for us to say like, as a usability option, we could have it that when you're, you know, drag, you start dragging the item, it might make different items glow or something in your inventory that you can interact with. That's an example of sort of giving the player a bit of a prompt as, you know, the players pick the item up and they're like, oh, what I could do with this? I could shove it on this or that. Uh, we can't do that at the moment, uh, but the UI system has been prioritized as before the rendering system. So hopefully we'll start to see that come in soon. Cool. Awesome. Hey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know there's there's plans to look at how to approach this from the studio's perspective. My caution is in <laughs> there's so much work that goes into making these maps, particularly to make them really properly that it's very difficult to do them when you're pricing it in the, in the kind of the standardized way we have now. And like if we release them as paid DLC, the problem is you can really fracture the community because then people don't have it. And then there's not as people, many people on it. I don't really have an answer to how to approach that. Um, but what I think is gonna help us in the interim is modding. Like so many of the mod packs are just awesome. And maybe there's kind of this combined approach where we can provide support to some of the better map makers so that they can be made free. And that means that there's not the same economic problem that we face from developing them. So I, it's a shame. I don't really have a definitive answer for you. I'm hopeful that modders will be able to fill the gap until we can figure out a way of, of dealing with that in terms of proper content. Yeah, so I think it kind of actually presents one of the challenges we have. So Daisy is a multiplayer game that has a one-time fee. You know, I'm not a big fan of free-to-play. Like, if you made Daisy free-to-play, the problem is there's no cosmetic items. Uh, and it's so difficult to make a new map that it's not like you could say, oh, well, you just, just pay $2 for the map or whatever, because you're not going to survive. So this is kind of an example of long-term as an issue we have to deal with. How can we you know, continue to support modding um, and still, you know, make sure that the, the game is sustainable long term. Mm. Um, so vehicles and uh, building fortifications sort of coming up. Um, what are you doing to uh, uh, make sure there's sort of ownership of those things as far as like locking and unlocking? Yeah, it's quite a point of contention in the development team. I, I, one thing I quite like about our team is we, we just about never agree on anything. Um, you know, and, and that's good, like, like having, having that kind of ho whole bunch of opposing viewpoints I think is really helping us uh, and will help us a lot in the future. So whether to have stuff lockable, I think, um, I think we will have some form of locking, but any time we'll have locking, we'll have a way around it whether that's getting a welding torch and cutting it open or lock picking it or something. Uh, we're fortunate to have gained a few new um, design members who, who I think have a lot of skill in terms of balancing. I'm not good at balancing because I just don't do it. So, um, so it's kind of good to have that strength in the team because otherwise I think you can end up with an OP scenario. Did you have an idea of how you could see it working? Uh, as far as like having keys and being able to um, uh, take keys off of someone's body, and I can see I can see that working really well um, with actually being able to steal from people in the standalone, uh, handcuffing them to actually be able to, for there to actually be ways to get the keys other than just buying the vehicle at like one of the stores. 
I know we were playing with some prototypes along that basis. That's, I mean, it's kind of a bit of an aside, but that's why I'm so interested in getting the modding uh, back into things because I'm really hopeful that I, I think I think in some ways we haven't shown as the core development team the true potential of some of the changes we've made in the engine, and I think I really hope that when we get the modding out there that the Epoch team will be able to look at standalone and say, you know what, that's really worth us releasing DAISY Epoch on the standalone. Um, and hopefully there's a way we can support that. Uh, and I've come to the conclusion I don't think it's going to fracture the community because I think that, yeah, some of the awesome, and that's where like they can do and it's some of the experimentation that we can't do with that kind of lockable stuff. So. If we don't solve the locking problem, I'm really confident that the Epoch team, yeah, will be able to. But I think, uh, yeah, I think we'll get something in there. We just want to make sure that you can't just lock this chest and have it permanent and it just sits there forever. Mm. Thanks. Awesome. Hey. Uh, nice hey. t-shirt, by the way. Uh, well, uh, first, uh, so from English, uh, uh, since the engine is still updated constantly, uh, do they, uh, have you considered uh, doing the information to the game? Say again? Doing the... Do the information? Uh, in terms of like a new engine and stuff like that? Uh, I mean, for example, uh, since you're working with the game right now and still doing the new regular and also working into the PlayStation 4, uh, I don't know if you uh, have considered doing the information as a feature uh, for the game in the new future or... Yeah, well, that's kind of what we're doing. The, part of the problem with DayZ is that it got really popular and everyone really wanted it straight away. So we needed to do something. Otherwise, you know, n no one will be there to play it. So what we did was, uh, you know, we made the game. I, I, th I was going to be happy if about 400,000 people bought it. I, I was a little bit worried that the time had maybe passed a little bit. So we were quite shocked in a good way with the number of sales. And what it meant that we could do was then we could go, okay, well, let's, let's do a lot more. So, um, like, and so we've kind of almost looked at that a little bit. Like, basically, we've, we've sort of refocused, we, we've, re, we've changed the scope. Is that kind of what you mean? Like, in terms of, you know, whether we wanted to change the scope and stuff like that? Yeah, okay. Uh, I mean, for example, if someone can inform the Oh, right, okay, so, so like getting really crazy about that stuff. I think, I think part of the problem we have is that as you, it's really easy to come up with new ideas, but part of the problem is we've been slowly introducing little features to the game, but each of those little features is costing us performance. The problem we have is that on the server at the client at the moment, we have a finite level of performance. We've done an incredible amount of optimization, but it's all been eaten up by new stuff. Throwing, so we have physics being conducted on every item as you throw it round. Uh, you know, a whole bunch of new zombies, heaps more loot, all this stuff eats up performance. So while we can look at things like deformable terrain and stuff like that, and there's even been prototypes done at BI to look at that kind of stuff, procedural terrain and all that. It's just, you end up killing, we end up killing the project. And I think people are frustrated enough at the moment with the pace and the fact that things don't break that we really need to make a lot of what we have now work. So, uh, you know, our aim is to keep the game sustainable so that we can, inter we can look at this stuff as it goes on. Like even once the Daisy hits beta, Bohemia still want to look at, you know, doing awesome stuff like I'd love to see us do dismembering zombies and stuff like that, but it's just so hard to do that stuff and still maintain the performance, particularly until we, we've got this glass ceiling at the moment because we don't have true multi-core support on the server. There's just this finite limit what we can do. At least now we have 64-bit service, which allows us to increase stuff. Like it's, you know, Space Engineers has full 64-bit support and they can do like massive asteroids and stuff. And, Galactic Civilizations 3 is only, you can only play it if you have 64 bits. So, yeah, it's just, we just got to chip away at it slowly. I hope, has that kind of answered your question? Yeah, uh, it has. Cool. Thanks. Hey, there. I have hey. two questions. One, are there any guns you want to put in the game? 
particularly, in, you know, the ones you've always wanted to implement in a game. And two, as a fan of Armored 3, I beat it. When I go back to Daisy, I find myself really missing the, uh, the movement system that Armored 3 introduced. Is there any chance of backporting that in? Yeah, so we've, we've been fiddling with the um, movement system for a long time. It's hard because Armour's very much about that sort of tactical, full-on tactical nature. But a lot of what we're trying to do in DayZ is not just that. And so we're trying to add an element of grittiness and an element of different things. So we've, and also in Armour, it's kind of designed around a particular kind of weapon. Whereas in DayZ, you know, we're dealing with a very diverse range of weaponry and melee as well. And this is what we face even with controls, is it's easy enough to come up with a control system for melee, and it's easy enough to come up with a control system for weapons, but then how do you have a shared control system that deals with, okay, I have a bat in my hand and I can use it, I have a rifle in my hand, I can fire it, but also the rifle, I can use it in melee as well. So we just end up with this really difficult problem we haven't kind of solved. Uh, the, the guy who came up with the movement system, uh, Vesper, for Armour 3, he's actually full-time on DayZ. We've loaned him back to Armour 3 for a little bit to help with some stuff, but so the brainchild behind all that, um, he's actually on DayZ. So he's kind of experimenting with different ways to go. Yeah, so to answer your other point about weapons, I'm not a super gun nut. I really love the Browning High Power because it was about the only thing I could shoot anything with in the army. My, my whole, like, um, my, my um, officer training course mates will probably la be laughing right now. Um, I was super uncoordinated. So, I don't know, I really like that pistol, so I'd love to see the Browning High Power um, actually get into the game. Uh, and, um, uh, yeah, I'm a big fan of pistols, so I'd love to see some of those in. Our lead artist, he's actually really into guns and really knowledgeable. Crystal Care, he a very key figure in the armor development community as well. So he's like, I don't know, I just have full faith in his understanding of where to go. Um, he's a, he came over to our team from America, like changed career and everything. So he's doing a pretty fantastic job. It's worth it's worthwhile catching him on Twitter because he's really active in terms of answering questions about where. Is there any weapon that you wanted to see in the game? Uh, well, I, I'm not expecting it because, you know, the high power, low rate of fire stuff is already kind of covered, but I love the ram. Yep, yep. Oh, I think that's on the list, isn't it, Brian? I think so. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was. We talked about it. It's such a beautiful weapon and such an iconic. Yeah, I, know. I know a lot of people get upset about us putting so many, like, Western um, weapons in the game, but I think that. You know, it's like it destroys the immersion in that. But I, th I think the idea is to try and make Daisy as a bit of a, like, open tapestry. You know, sorry, blank, you know, a blank slate that you can kind of do stuff on. And that's where I think that if we can just add a bunch of cool weapons to the game and a quite kind of diverse nature, and also weapons that people know and recognize. It's like me, I want, I want the Browning in because I've used it. And while that might not be super realistic for Tunerous, when you have stuff that's, that you know, you get this kind of emotional context with it. That was why we wanted to provide quite, quite a diverse range of characters. That was why we wanted to provide full range of female characters so that players could actually, you know, feel actually immersed in the game and not try to force you into, this is the kind of character you have to play. Was there anything else other than the grant you want? There's one very key specific element to it that just absolutely blew me away, and it's with the scope of weapons. Mm -hmm. And the fact that when you've got it down at grass, you can still see on your screen that the scope is picking up where it's pointed at. Mm -hmm. You actually see the point where it's aimed to, even before you even bring it up to your face. So I was kind of wondering if that was a mechanical element that if that hasn't ever come up before, maybe if you could like add that to the list of really cool things that would be great to see uh, if you get around to being able to do that with uh, the rendering engine once it gets updated. Yeah, so this is actually something we've been talking about a lot. We even talked about it before release. We were looking, so there's a couple of options. One is that we can make a shader 
that makes everything outside, so say when you go into scoped view, um, everything outside the scope will be kind of blurred, but the scope itself will be, you know, sharp and stuff like that. So that's one option to do is like a shader and things like that. But with the new renderer, the renderer that we're using um, from uh, the team, it's actually what was made, uh, used to make um, Take On Mars, which is actually looking amazing. Um, really amazing. I'm going to stream multiplayer when it comes out. It's pretty awesome. It's, if you're into that kind of stuff, check out Take On Mars. And, and if you want to look at what the graphics and the visuals might look like in DayZ, that's a good example. So that actually has a really fantastic method of render to texture. So if you look at um, Armour 3 has awesome render to texture, but Armour 3 is this massive game. Like the scope of Armour 3 is, it's really quite mind boggling. Like you can just about do anything. With Daisy, we've tried to narrow the scope a bit, and I think that we've been talking about, but we can't confirm, that we could deal with that scope issue through render to texture. So basically there'd be a little camera at the other end of the scope, and it would be picking up what is out there and it would be rendering it, which would allow us to do zoom, um, much like Red Orchestra and stuff like that. Uh, but it's not on the definite list. It's maybe made it to, I, I like to divide things into must, should, and could. It's probably weaseled its way from could to should now. Um, but whether we do a full, like, rendered a texture for the scope, or whether we do that more, okay, we're just gonna sort of fake a, uh, shader to, to make the scopes look a bit better. We'll do one or the other. So we'll do something. We'll probably try render to texture and see what the performance impact is. Uh, I'm just wondering if uh, private servers with private hives are going to be supported anytime soon. Yeah, absolutely. So the hive system currently functions. Uh, one of the problems with that is it can become very difficult to know whether a problem is because of the modding and the private hive or whether it's a problem with, but that's only if you support modding. We could do private hives and private servers um, basically now. Um, we're just a little worried about fracturing the community. Honestly, I think we're at the point where we're considering doing it before the end of the year. How far away are we, Brian, from Yeah, so so we're pretty we're pretty close. Um, we've been sorry. Go ahead. I, uh, I mean, like I, I understand that you're only allowing posts on like game servers and mm -hmm. a couple of other sites. Um, I have a bunch of my own hardware, you know, posted on DC. Uh, I'd like to be able to use that. Um, yeah, I know that's a it's a very controversial decision we made, um, in, in terms of to support only a few like server providers. The problem has been we just have such big uh, security vulnerabilities at the moment from giving everyone the files. Um, we had the source leak, so maybe it doesn't matter anymore. Um, but we've changed things a lot since then, and we're continuing to do so. Like, I saw a thread on Reddit. I don't know if you saw someone complaining about hackers, uh, like really bad hackers. It's really hard for me to know whether that's just someone who's kind of like really fed up or whether it's true, because certainly, I find the hacking is a lot less now than it was in the mod. That's certainly my feel. And I do think that the ultimate solution to that is to allow private servers and private hives. Um, but I'm just, I am really reluctant to push the server files out to anyone. It's not some big monopoly where we get paid money. Like, we don't get paid any money by the server providers. And in fact, the server providing situation is kind of rough for them because we insist that they provide a certain amount of public servers that are free. So it's very costly for them. So they needed the opportunity to actually like break even, um, which is what we've been providing them. Yeah, I mean, I a lot of the questions. Some might like to see uh, Windows servers with the, uh, you know, uh, configuration options for, um, Turning up the number of zombies that are spawned or turning them down, uh, PvP on and off, um, changing what everybody is spawns with, all that kind of stuff. Like, yeah, look, uh, and, and absolutely, that's exactly what we want to do. I feel that um, server providers are getting a pretty crappy, sorry, not server providers, server owners are getting a very crappy deal at the moment. Um, and, you know, we're trying to deal with that, and I feel like we've added little bits and pieces in. 
there's just there's just so much moving at the moment that it's been very hard to add things in. I think that when we do get the private hives in, that will really help because people will be able to build their own communities. We won't have people complaining about people kicking people and stuff like that. Unfortunately, the new renderer, as awesome as it's going to be, it has delayed modding. Because if we released it all now, they'd have to completely redo the way that they do their mods. And I just don't think that's good for us, um, and I don't think it's good for the community. But I think once we release that, modders will be able to tackle all this stuff as well. So sure, we need to provide like hard-coded ways to change the number of zombies spawning and stuff like that. We already do that at the moment in the mission. So basically, when we want to change the amount of zombies in the loot, we just change a little, uh, a little variable, and, it, and it's read by the server when it starts it up. So when we basically provide that, um, we can basically talk to the server providers and, and basically turn that on pretty quickly. The only problem we have at the moment is that we're right at the limit. So we, our minimum is 15 frames per second for the server. We used to have it at 10. Um, I think actually Battlefield or something runs on the server at 15 frames too. So people go, oh, that's terrible. But you've got to remember, that's the server. That basically means that the server's checking its entities like 15 times a second, which is quite fast. It's like a tick rate. Yeah, the tick rate, exactly. Um, and so, yeah, I think our sweet spot is 20. The problem is if we give server, provide, server, hosts, uh, like server owners the ability to change that, they might set it to some crazy value and provide a really bad experience, and then people blame that on us. Okay, mm. cool, thank you. All right, so I have a couple of questions. Uh, the first one had to do with, you were talking about Steam, Steam Workshop integration, and you were talking about uh, mods being supported in the future. So those two seem like they go hand in hand very well because people could post their own creations and then mod developers or people who want server administrators who want to use mods then have a huge selection of things they can add. Uh, however, will you be enabling the um, addition of Steam Workshop creations into the mainline client? Yeah, I think so. Like we're looking to integrate it as much as possible. I spent a lot of time talking with Valve. They've been fantastic, like real mentors for me. So we basically, um, yeah, that's what we want to do. We want to integrate it as much as we can, but it's not something that we're just going to be able to turn on. Because that, that, and, it, and it's going to require some help from Valve um, to do that. And they're definitely committed to helping us do that. It's, we don't have the same situation as Space Engineers where we just have one file that we deploy. We really need like multiple files and and there's a lot of large files that we, we transfer and stuff like that. So absolutely, that's what we want to do. We want to have it as seamless as possible, uh, and we want to make it easy for people to put stuff on the workshop. Yeah. So then you were also talking about how you wanted this to be an open tapestry, sort of. Mm -hmm. So are there any then limitations to things that players could create? So you could say they can make weapons, but they couldn't make vehicles? Are there any limitations? I think that will, that will depend on the servers. So the public, the public like Hive, that will be no mods, that will be full vanilla. But if you are running your own Hive and your own server, you will be able to choose exactly what you want to do. Just like kind of how, I really like how Space Engineers is doing it now. I think that's a good solution that we can look at. Yeah. And they did that very quick. Like, I was skeptical, I was like, hey, mods coming out. And it just seems to work quite well now, until it crashes, but. The game world is quite static in terms of weather right now. Uh, it would be very interesting to both see uh, not just different types of weather like fog and rain and hailstorms or whatever, but things that actually affect players. So if it's yeah, yeah. Say, super hailing out, it might be dangerous to go outside or something. I know our designers are working on it. Um, actually, I really like the visuals of H1Z1's um, weather. I think that's really good. Yes. But th that's a good example of where they're kind of starting from a really good platform with Planetside 2, so they can afford to look at that kind of stuff um, in terms of the visuals. We've, we've thought about doing seasons in DayZ, but it's kind of like what I was talking about with that guy before. We, we've just got to not get too, too distracted at the moment. But the survival aspects are under the hood for weather already. We just need to start developing all the weather type stuff. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Thank you very much. Thanks. I, I don't have very long for questions. This is the backpack guy. If you look on my Twitter, he has an awesome bat. You don't have it with you. Oh, it's, here. it's here. Yeah, should check it out afterwards. He, he made the Daisy backpack. Um, so Daisy has had a, a pretty large number of alpha testers over the last year. I know that's kind of like a controversial thing, but 
How do you feel about that? Has it been helpful, harmful to the overall process? Um, I think it's been fantastic. Like what it does, the 2.5 million people are like, oh, that's a lot of money. It's not just a good idea to throw money at a video game. Money to a video game does not make an awesome video game. It just means you've spent a lot of money. So, um, but what it does do is it basically says this is a really good idea. And if we didn't have the 2.5 million players, you might not see games like uh, H1Z1 coming out and stuff like that. So that's kind of what I'm really pleased with. As you know, not only is Bohemia, which is a studio that I have a tremendous amount of respect for, they now have the resources not just to do DayZ, but a bunch of other games in the future. Um, it means that, yeah, so, so that's, that to me there's a big positive thing, as it's not just that we've got the alpha testers, it's that we've got all these people. However, there is the negative side of it. And I think there's a lot of people who haven't really understood what, that, what this process means. And I don't think that's really their fault. And that's why I've been talking with Valve about how we can make that more obvious to, to players. Not just big capital letters, but actually stuff you have to click through to buy it. And, you know, and, and, and Valve, are, they're, they're wanting to experiment with this too. And I don't know if this kind of answers your question, but that's, that's the problem I see, is people not really understanding, not for their own fault, but not understanding what they're getting into. And I think with my next games, that's something I really want to make sure I do a lot better. It'll have to be kind of quick, this last question, I think. All right, um, yeah, it's not too complicated. I, I'm just wondering, with all the, you know, new games that have popped up that have some of the issues, like H1Z1 on um, mm -hmm. seven days and all, all these others, like, uh, how, how has that changed in some ways the direction, if at all? And um, Daisy has really, like, stayed on top you know, so far in terms of popularity and user base and whatnot. Um, so I'm curious as, you know, what do you think causes that? Yeah, I think um, uh, multiplayer, the reason I like multiplayer games is because nothing else pulls you through but your design. You can't put a good cutscene in, you can't just make it look awesome. It's purely about the multiplayer design. And I think this is where a lot of, on the AAA publisher side, a lot of people have fallen over a bit because the AAA approach tends to be, you know, you, you can do a really great job of um, having a great story and a good cut scene and you can, sp you can spend a lot of money on that kind of stuff, but it doesn't necessarily deliver a good um, multiplayer experience. And that's where, if we can keep f focused and, and keep prov trying to provide that, and I still think we're a long way from providing that, I think we get a very forgiving approach from the community. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's, that's, that's the secret. We just got to stay true to that. And I think if we stay true to that, we'll be all right. Cool. So thanks, uh, thanks very much, everyone. Um, we, have, uh, we have these Daisy limited edition postcards. Um, afterwards, um, myself and Brian, we're really happy to take your questions. Just make sure you go right to the back away from the interest areas and we'll be there for a while. You can ask questions, more than happy to give away these signed. I think this is the last time we might end up giving these away, at least in North America. Um, so yeah, and really happy to talk to, to you guys and, and thanks for being so supportive. Cheers.